Hey, can you guys hear me? Okay, awesome, awesome. Right, um, so really, you've got chemistry tomorrow, so um, feel free to ask away, guys. Um, any questions, um, any topics you're revising or you want me to go through, I'm just going to go through. So, anybody having trouble with anything, just say, I'm just kind of doing a random one, not like a, a planned one. Just so, just going to go through any topics you guys want to go through, basically. So, feel free to ask any questions for any topics you want to go through. And I will um, go through whatever you guys want. Yeah, I'll go through the endothermic, exothermic, practical. All right, yeah, let me go through that first. Uh, Sophie wants to go through that. All right, sorry, I'm just... Um, cool. Just send in someone the link. All right, let's go through your practical. So if you get the exothermic, endothermic practical, um, this is in the energetics topic or energy changes. So <clears throat> what you're going to get is a polystyrene cup, most likely two reactants going in here. Yeah, salts, bases, neutralization, I'll go through that as well. Fuel cells, okay, electrolysis, yeah, 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 calorimeter. Okay, let's go through, I'm trying to use this whiteboard at the moment, which is like, um, hold on, I haven't really mastered using this one before. So, you're going to stick your reactants, so you're going to stick your reactants inside this polystyrene cup. Now, normally they could be an acid and a base and for this one you're going to want to take the temperature using a thermometer now if the temperature goes up then what type of reaction is it if we get an increase in temperature And this, this isn't always neutralization, but often it's a neutralization reaction. So, so this is how you're measuring the energy transferred, often in a neutralization reaction. If um, the temperature goes up on the thermometer, what does this tell you? So... Yeah, that's right. It's exothermic, Daniel. That's absolutely right. So if the temperature goes up, it's exothermic, uh, which means heat is given out to the surroundings. You just want to make sure that you um, are watching out. Are the students in the question using a polystyrene cup, which is an insulator? They should be using a polystyrene cup. They probably... It's not just enough to use a polystyrene cup. They should have a beaker with extra insulation. What is this... Uh, stuff I could be putting around the beaker. So, uh, what's this stuff I could be putting around the beaker here? Um, yeah, you can put a lid on like that. 
cool and cotton wool in the beaker around the edges that's going to insulate it so look out for in the exam question if they give you this it might be just a complete write up from scratch a six marker as it's a core practical but also it might be that there's someone else's work you're evaluating and saying how they could make it more accurate so you need cotton wool in the beaker you need a polystyrene cup you need a lid and a lid and all of this is going to reduce heat loss so when you measure your temperature change your uh, the energy change is always going to be less than the real one the accurate temperature change we can never get it exactly because of heat loss so it's always going to be slightly less if the temperature goes up it's exothermic if it goes down it's endothermic and you just if you're doing the temperature change it, you could be comparing different chemicals then keep the concentrations the same keep the volumes the same and that type of thing so um yeah that's really all for that one for the neutral uh, for the energy one cool cool okay now what else do people want to go through um Okay. Electrolysis. All right, guys. So For electrolysis, you've got the positive and negative electrodes. So there's two types of electrolysis, guys. You've got electrolysis of molten substances. So how do you know something's molten? It's going to say liquid. Okay. And what's quite easy is if you're doing electrolysis of molten substances, he says, uh, you're going to have positive ion and a negative ion. I'm feeling really rough today, by the way. Um, okay, so this is electrolysis of molten substances. Super easy. Which one of these ions, the sodium positive ion or the chlorine negative ion, which ion is going where? So why are they attracted to each of the electrodes? Okay, guys, you need to be able to write half equations. So Does anybody know the half equation for the formation of sodium at the negative electrode? So the sodium ions are going to come here and you'll need to be able to write the half equation for the sodium ions going to the negative electrodes. Yeah, so we can say opposites attract. That's right, Daniel. However, um, <clears throat> Yeah, the positive ion goes to the cathode and vice versa due to opposite attraction. You can say that as as well. That's good. But what's it, you might get a three mark. So opposites attract isn't enough. What is going to happen to the sodium ion when it goes to the cathode or the negative electrode? What else is going to happen? Something else is going to happen. What's going to happen to that sodium ion? What's it going to pick up from the cathode? It's going to uh, pick something up from the cathode. It's going to pick up an electron. We call this the half equation. So you need to know this. So if it was three marks, why does sodium form at the cathode? We need to say it gains an electron. Absolutely, Daniel, it's reduced. You have to say that. So it's, you can say, yeah, it's positive. The electrode is negative and opposites attract. But the main reason it goes there is to get reduced and gain an electron. So this is reduction. 
you might you might remember oil rig probably from school so reduction is gain of electrons it's been reduced now at the over here at the positive electrode we have chlorine gas released so most of the non-metals in electrolysis um, are diatomic do you remember what diatomic means does anyone know what diatomic means so diatomic means you have a little two they come together like so I've done that really badly let's get rid of that okay just trying to write this out I think I'm using a slightly fat pen here okay so that's the half equation at the positive electrode two chloride ions go there they become oxidized they lose electrons and they become a chlorine molecule I should really have a little two in front of the electrons over here to balance it this is the most common in all of the chemistry exams this is the most common one if you've only got time to remember one half equation the chloride ion half equation is the most common one okay so chloride ions two chloride ions turn into one chlorine molecule and release two electrons and this is oxidation so if you're asked why does chlorine gas form at the positive electrode your answer would be chloride ions are negative they're attracted to the positive electrode but more importantly they become oxidized and they lose electrons at the positive electrode some people say the chlorine or chloride is discharged into chlorine at the positive electrode okay chlorine gas is formed also here for paper one chemistry you need to know the test for chlorine as chlorine comes off a lot as a gas what's the test for chlorine does anyone know the test it's not just in paper two under chemical analysis it's also in the core practical of electrolysis so you need to know how to test for chlorine gas anyone know how to test for chlorine gas you can use pH paper damp pH paper or damp litmus paper does anyone know what happens to chlorine with um, damp litmus paper or damp pH paper yeah that's right damp litmus paper but what color does it go what happens to it so yeah you need to know this um, bleached white thank you Maya yes absolutely it bleaches white you are allowed to say it turns red first because it's acidic and then it bleaches white I know it's a bit of a surprise that this this is normally in paper two but there's just a small bit of fine print on the electrolysis core practical saying you need to know your test for chlorine oxygen and hydrogen because they can all possibly be released in electrolysis you need to know how to test for them I know you all know the squeaky pop lit splint for hydrogen and oxygen gas relights a glowing splint you probably all know that the chlorine's the tricky one bleaches damp litmus paper white so watch out for that it might come up um, you could be asked how to set up a electrolysis practical um so how to set up an electrolysis practical i don't know why i'm using this fat pen right um so to set up an electro electrolysis practical we're going to need the battery you need to connect it with wires to a cathode and an anode so to two electrodes we call what do we call the liquid the molten or aqueous solution that we are electrolyzing what do we call that anyone know what we call the solution in this case it's molten sodium and chloride ions we call it the electrolyte I don't know if I've got a delay on you guys being able to chat so um, yeah we call that the electrolyte and that's made up of sodium ions and chloride ions um, so that could come up as well what else what else what else yes also you may be asked if this comes up as a core practical you may be asked how to actually collect the gases so what can you place over the electrodes to collect the gases yeah that's right electrolytes what could you put over the two electrodes to collect the gases guys
I always forget there's a slight delay. I know why there's a delay. I need to go to... No, not there. I need to go there. Yeah, test tubes, Dan Walker. And if you want to know the volume, you could use a measuring cylinder or a gas syringe. Yeah, you could use a gas syringe. Yep, gas syringe is totally cool. Measuring cylinders are probably a little bit easier than a gas syringe, to be honest. I would say test tube or a gas syringe. If you want to know the volume of chlorine given off, use the gas syringe. I just want to zing down here. I don't think I've my... Uh, I think I've got something called high latency going on because I forgot when I set up this live stream. So there's a little bit of extra delay. So, um, yeah. Cool. Right. Okay. That's all fairly covered. Let's zing to the slightly harder electrolysis. Yeah. That was me trying to find. There's a button I can press which it increases your ability to chat the speed between what I say and that. But I've... I've uh, messed that up for today so don't worry I ain't gonna fiddle around right um okay guys if you're doing the higher paper I'm sure most of you are doing the higher paper from your answers doesn't matter if you're not but um then you're far more likely to be asked about electrolysis of solutions okay and there's a big difference so let's just go to sodium chloride again but this time, A, Q. Can you see where, uh, yeah, you can do, uh, I probably put it right underneath my photograph because I'm stupid like that. Okay, so um, let's do that again there. All right. Okay, guys, what ions, what ions are present in sodium chloride solution? Anyone know there's four ions in sodium chloride solution? And the rules of electrolysis with solutions are different. So, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Inside a solution, uh, nice one, Mr. Walker, very good. We have sodium ions, chloride ions, and then from the aqueous, from the AQ, we have OH minus, our hydroxide ions. Remember when we're talking acids and bases later on, hydroxide ions are responsible for making things alkaline. They turn universal indicator or pH paper blue or purple, and hydrogen ions are responsible for turning pH paper orange, red, or yellow. Uh, they are what create an acid. Now, obviously, when you've got equal amounts of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, we've got a neutral solution, and this would be neutral, but we're not talking about acids and alkalis. We're talking about um, electrolysis. So, let's get to it. You've got a bit of a battle. Only two of these can come off, and the rules of electrolysis. So, you need to know your rules of solutions. It's far more likely for you to get this. So, the rules of solutions are, if a halide ion is present yikes if a halide ion is present then a halogen is discharged at the positive electrode so that rule means if there is a halide ion present is there a halide ion present here and the answer, of course, is yes. We have a halide ion. Halide means they come from group 7. Don't get halide and halogen mixed up. A halogen has the formula Cl2, would be chlorine, and a halide would be chloride and have the formula Cl-. They're two different things. People think, oh, it's okay to say chloride or chlorine. It's not. So the chloride ion, the chlorine doesn't go to the electrode. The chloride ion goes to the electrode and chlorine is discharged. Okay, so that's just as normal, and just as normal we can write our little um, half equation to show that. 
and this is the half equation as I said if you just had to learn one half equation that's the most common one to come up over there okay so that's the half equation and again why are chloride ions going there they are being oxidized okay so we're getting oxidized over here we're losing electrons so you want to know that that could you could put that in an answer now here's the difficult bit is it the sodium ions or the hydrogen ions they're both positive there's only one can be the winner who's going to the negative electrode and getting discharged so you guys have got the four ions but who's going to the negative electrode and being discharged is it hydrogen ions or is it chloride ions and by the way we can leave behind our little um, hydroxide ions because we already said they don't get a look in they're left behind the chloride ions were the ones that got discharged very good Mr. Walker yes absolutely spot on it is hydrogen ions because they're less reactive go to the negative electrode and are discharged as hydrogen gas and if you're given the core practical it's likely to be one where you need to put two measuring cylinders over so it's likely to be you're discharging hydrogen and chlorine or oxygen and hydrogen right um, and the half equation for this for the hydrogen ions is H plus now we're going to add an electron to get rid of the charges see electrolysis uses electricity to separate a compound or to form elements um, from ions so now hydrogen is one of the seven diatomic molecules molecules that are made of two atoms have no fear of ice cold beer and they are the seven that's a mnemonic to know the seven diatomic molecules hydrogen <coughs> nitrogen fluorine oxygen iodine chlorine and bromine so all of the halogens oxygen nitrogen and hydrogen so we put a little two after that there we need to balance this with a two here oh my god that's the worst two in the history of twos um there we go yeah so hydrogen gas comes off and it's hydrogen ions that go because they're less reactive so that's the other rule listen you've got chemistry tomorrow if it's a solution hydrogen's coming off and less copper is there the only metal that's less reactive than hydrogen is copper so if we're in a situation where we have copper ions then the hydrogen gets left behind all right guys so you can just really think it's it's 99 percent it's going to be hydrogen that's being discharged um so i can get rid of that that's staying behind okay my hydrogen and chlorine are coming off what's left in the electrolyte at the end of the experiment when it's all said and done what's been left behind <laughs> have no fear of ice cold beer um yeah yeah they're the seven diatomic molecules you need to know about okay what i want to know is what's left behind in the solution what's left in the electrolyte if we remove the chlorine and the hydrogen from our four if we remove the chlorine and hydrogen from the four ions that were in the electrolyte what two ions are left behind um we'll have a look i've put a red cross through the ones that are left behind so if these guys are coming off and sodium is left behind and hydroxide ions are left behind our electrolyte is going to be sodium hydroxide this is what's left behind okay that's all that's left over and that can be used as a, it's got lots of uses and we actually call the electrolysis of sodium chloride it's known as the electrolysis of brine salt water and the reason is because it creates hydrogen for hydrogen fuel cells it creates chlorine for killing bacteria in tap water and swimming pools and you get left behind with sodium hydroxide which can be used as an alkali to neutralize stuff and it can be used as a bleach as well sodium hydroxide so um, yeah it's a really important electrolysis in industry right let's just do one more thing here
Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So I want to speed through. Oh, jeez. Holy manoli. Okay, people, I've got, uh, this is, anyone got an idea what this weird electrolysis is for? This is for the extraction of aluminium. Okay, so you need to know about the extraction of aluminium. And we get aluminium, oops, we get aluminium from um, aluminium oxide. Does anyone know why we can't extract aluminium using carbon? Um, yeah, so if you study the international IGCSE example, you no longer need to know about the extraction of aluminium oxide aluminium from aluminium oxide but if you're studying AQA combined science or separate science you still need to know about the extraction of aluminium oxide and it won't be in your they kind of skim over it and don't really mention it in the CGP book which is a bit of a bummer but you do need to know this so uh, for paper one yeah uh, Dan you're right yeah aluminium is yeah it's too reactive so we can't we can't extract it the old-fashioned way by heating it with carbon and stealing the oxygen, which would be reduction. We can't reduce aluminium oxide with carbon. Carbon is lower in the reactivity series, so we've got to use electrolysis, which, remember, guys, in AQA, when you're talking about electrolysis, a lot of money uh, is spent on heating and paying for the electricity. Why heating? Because you've got to melt the aluminium oxide. Now, aluminium oxide melts at something crazy like 2,300 degrees, so it's going to cost you super amounts of money how can we lower the cost how can we lower the melting points so it doesn't cost us so much what can we add what can we add to aluminium oxide to lower its melting point so it doesn't cost us so much money there's a chemical you need to know for AQA and OCR and Edexcel really um, that lowers the melting point of aluminium oxide begins with a C and it's how, how, how yeah, it's how some of you might feel after the paper, the exam paper tomorrow. Yep, and you might be feeling like having a light cry, uh, cryolite after the exam tomorrow. Yeah, so cryolite, guys, this reduces the melting point, so it's good for the environment, less carbon dioxide released, you save money, so very good. That lowers the melting point. Anyway, what are the ions inside? We have Al3+. plus. Aluminium is in group three. All metals form positive ions. So just look up the group number. If, when you come into the exam, the first thing to do on your data book in the first 10 seconds, go to group one, write plus one, group two, plus two, group three, plus three. And then you can write group five, minus three, group six, minus two, group seven, minus one. That way, any time in the exam, they say, what's the charge on this iron? Flip to your periodic table and you've already written the charges for all the groups if you want to do that. Um, and oxygen forms two minus. Right, we've got two half equations here. So, aluminium three plus ions are going to come down here and react with the bottom of the container. Um, and really easy half equation, Al3 plus. Are they getting oxidized? Is this oxidation or reduction when the aluminium ions turn into aluminium atoms is that oxidation or reduction so al3 plus plus 3e minus what do you reckon oxidation or reduction and then o2 minus is coming here can anyone write the half equation for the electrolysis half equation for oxygen going to the positive electrode Ah, 
When you gain electrons, Musa, this would be gaining electrons. And gain of electrons is reduction. So we would say aluminium is reduced, gains three electrons. So aluminium is reduced as it gains three electrons. No probs. Um, oxygen, difficult one. If you do, if this does come up, I mean, this this has only come up once in the last five years. The this extraction of aluminium. Um, you're going to do this half equation goes to oxygen plus. 4e minus, yeah, pretty disgusting. Uh, nice, so cool. Now, the next thing, there is a side reaction here, okay? There's a side reaction. What's oxygen is coming off of here? Does anyone know what material we make these electrodes out of? What material are the electrodes made out of? Yeah, that's yeah, that's the correct half equation. What material are the electrodes made out of, though? Does anyone know what? Obviously, we need them to conduct electricity. So what should we make those electrodes out of? What solid material do you know of that can conduct electricity? Yeah, carbon. You can call it graphite or carbon. Graphite's made of carbon. So, yeah. Graphite or carbon. Great. Nice one, guys. Yeah, that's right, Musa. So, carbon dioxide gets made. And it might, might make you ask the question, why the do they use carbon? Because what happens is, as the oxygen's released, the oxygen, the oxygen reacts with the carbon to form carbon dioxide and this wears away the electrode slowly wears away the electrode like this and the electrode ends up I mean if that happens to all of the electrodes the electrolysis will stop because it will no longer conduct electricity if they go above the electrolyte you might say to yourself why do after these stupid people make the electrodes out of carbon well the reason is carbon is cheap compared to the alternative the alternative is to use giant 10 foot platinum platinum's an unreactive metal or giant copper electrodes that's just really really expensive carbon's a lot cheaper so you're better off just wearing out your carbon electrodes and replacing them yeah it does get eroded away that's right it reacts and erodes away and at which point the electrolysis you'll need to replace them otherwise the the circuit is no longer complete and electrons cannot move remember this is a circuit so electrons are moving through the electrolyte up the electrodes and round in a circle okay i think that's pretty much electrolysis done i might have missed bits but otherwise i'm going to end up spending all the time on electrolysis now i'm just going to quickly go through acid bases first before I go through some other stuff because someone said that I remember someone said acid base so oh my good gosh hmm am I back Okay, got a bit lost there. Are we back? Are we back? Mayday, mayday. <sighs> right, acids and base. So what we got to get into? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Jeez, hope not. Right, awesome. Right, we've got acid plus base. By the way, um, all acids are AQ. So, yeah, do you need to know that? Probably not. This is a solid base, copper oxide. Copper oxide's a really common one for them to use. It's insoluble. That means it doesn't dissolve in the products. So, we're going to make salt and water. So, 
it's very very handy to do acid base reactions with an insoluble base does anyone know the name of the salt that gets formed so I've got hydrochloric acid plus copper oxide make something and water what would be my salt in this situation guys oh anyone know the name of the salt Okay, the salt is copper chloride, well done. Yes, 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 yes. Copper chloride, now copper chloride, like 99% of chlorides is soluble because chlorides are soluble. So that's a salt that will dissolve in the water that's also formed. Well done, yeah, copper chloride. Now why did I pick this one? Because one of the core practicals that they love to ask is... Um, how to, so they'll come with a question like this um, how would you make a pure dry sample of copper chloride and that would be six marks okay so that's a six marker how would you make a pure dry sample of copper chloride so obviously we're gonna say if they haven't told us what acid to use, if you can't work it out, just say mix acid and base together. I'm going to say warm HCl with copper oxide. Now, to make copper chloride, I could have used copper carbonate, CuCO3, just as good to use copper carbonate. It's a solid, um, but I'm using copper oxide. It's a solid base as well. Carbonates, you're just going to get the bubbling from carbon dioxide as well, but it's perfectly okay so I'm going to warm these two together what's going to happen is eventually I'm going to have in my beaker salt and water I've got the copper chloride as the salt guys and I've got the water now I'm going to keep adding the copper oxide, which is a black solid, so it's a good one to use because it's very visual, you can see. And eventually, I'm going to get to the point where I add it and there's excess copper oxide. This is a good thing. <laughs> so I add it till I've got excess. Why do I want to add excess? Because if I've added extra copper oxide, I know there's no acid left. So when I purify this and dry this, there's no HCl left. Now tell me, how can I get rid? I now want to just be left with the salt. So there's two practical processes you need to explain in a six marker. How are you going to get rid of the excess copper oxide? Yeah, this is all from paper one. How are we going to get rid of the excess copper oxide? How are we going to get rid of the water? Well, you could really argue that the hydrogen's joining to the oxygen. So you could say the hydrogen is more reactive and is stealing the oxygen off of the copper. But don't worry too much about the displacement. Yes, 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 Moose. So we've got to filter it. So first step, you're going to say filter off. I say first step, you've scored two marks already if you said the warm hydrochloric acid with copper oxide. Add the copper oxide in excess, then filter off excess copper oxide feel free if it's a six marker and you've got the time to write use a filter funnel and filtration paper but you might not gain extra marks for that but you might just you, you never know how stingy they're going to be right um how would we get rid of the water well i'm kind of covering yeah i'm kind of really basing um yeah i'm going through whatever people are asking me to go through but these things that people have asked me to go through are in their exam tomorrow so most of these are in aqa but a lot of these are also in igcse i'll point out if something is not relevant to you um if i know your exam board so we've got rid of everyone needs to know the salt practical if you've got acids and bases coming up tomorrow so whether you're doing IGCSE, AQA, if you've got the acid and base coming up tomorrow, you need to know this. It's a core practical in all of the exams. So um, 
No, it doesn't matter if you add the acid to the base. Well, we want to add the base in excess, so we probably add the base to the acid. But if you wrote that in the exam, add, add the base to the acid or acid to base, you won't lose any marks. No, but you just want to say, make sure I've got extra base, more base than I've got acid, because then the base afterwards, you know that all the acid's gone and you can get rid of the base. You can't really get rid of the acid because the acid dissolves in water. So if I had any extra acid, it would be like chilling out in the water and be very hard to separate unless I'm going to start doing fractional distillation. So we don't want a business there. So we filtered off the excess. So um, we filtered off the excess copper oxide. How are we now going to get rid of the water? So we're now left with just salt and water. So we've got, imagine we've we've bust out our filter funnel. If you forget the name of equipment, do diagrams. So we've got rid of the copper oxide. We've just got salt and water, guys. What are we going to do? Anyone got an idea? How do we get rid of the water? We want to be left with the salt, right? Nice. Evaporate. Place the basin over a beaker. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Let it evaporate until the crystallization point. Um, yeah, I'll go through the uh, hydrogen fuel cell. I'll go through those. You don't, you don't really need to know the half equations for the hydrogen fuel cell. You just need to know the overall equation. But I'll go through them. Um, so... Yeah, evaporate and crystallize. Nice. Nice, 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 nice. Well done. Right, listen. When you just say crystallize, there's a little bit more to it, okay? So evaporate um, by heating gently. Right, you want to heat gently. If you heat too hard, you might lose some salt because it might start boiling and spitting out. And so you might lose some of your product. But also if you boil too hard, you might get side reactions. You might get um, things reacting with nitrogen in the air to form nitrides and you might get impurities. So heat gently and then when crystals form, leave to cool, um, leave to cool to crystallize. I'm not going to write it all down because it's just it's just take too long. Right, leave it all to crystallize. Now the final step, if you can remember, refilter. Oh my gosh, I can't even spell. Refilter and dry with paper or with a towel. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, when you've left it to crystallize, there's still going to be like half a teaspoon of water left there. So refilter that off and then dry the crystals with a towel, and that's crystallization. Yes, that is the overall equation. Well done for um, the hydrogen fuel cells. Hydrogen, and now remember, they're not combustion in hydrogen. Uh, you dry it with a paper towel, Musa. Um, hydrogen in the hydrogen fuel cells, guys, you don't have to have hydrogen. Fuel cells use fuel. Hydrogen is the fuel um, for the hydrogen fuel cell. And the hydrogen provides electrons. It's not burning. There's no heat. We're not burning oxygen and hydrogen together, that would be seriously bad. You're talking people exploding and burning to death. So we're taking the hydrogen and electrons are being taken off of the hydrogen to leave hydrogen ions. And then the oxygen comes in, picks up the electrons from the hydrogen as they go through the motor of the car or whatever your fuel cells powering. It could be a light bulb. It could be the, the engine of the car, the motor. So the electrons leave the hydrogen, forming hydrogen ions. Then they come down the other electrode and meet the oxygen, join with the hydrogen ions and reform water. So you're actually just temporarily taking the electrons and pushing them through a circuit. You're more likely to be tested. You're not probably going to be asked the half equations for the hydrogen fuel cell. You're more likely to be asked about the advantages and disadvantages so you should be able to name three advantages and three disadvantages you can put them in the chat guys if you can think of three advantages and three disadvantages of a hydrogen fuel cell and um, you may well be asked to compare them to batteries and rechargeable batteries <laughs> uh, uh, so um, yeah We'll go into that. Anyway, this is the salt. Um, lots of questions. So, all right. One question on the boiling point of group one metals. Every, uh, so yeah, I'll just talk about the group one metals for a second with boiling points. The patterns are always opposite 
to non-metals. So ask yourself, do you know the pattern for the halogens boiling points? The halogens or halogens, they go from chlorine as, fluorine as a gas, chlorine as a gas, bromine as a liquid, iodine as a solid. So their boiling point is increasing because they're simple molecules and their intermolecular forces get stronger as we go down the group. So their boiling point's increasing. It's the opposite pattern for metals. So lithium, sodium, potassium, their boiling points actually decrease going down the group. They have an opposite pattern to the non-metals. And I don't think you need to be able to explain why they decrease, but the metallic bonds are not as strong going down the group because the delocalized electrons are further from the nucleus. So you have less attraction between the delocalized electrons and the positive ions, basically. But you don't need to know that. You just need to know their boiling points decrease going down the group. Um, yeah, what else did someone say? Um, you only need to know the process of a hydrogen fuel cell, how it works, if you are studying separate chemistry, AQA, then you need to know about the hydrogen fuel cells. <laughs> Titrations. You only need to know titrations if you're doing separate chemistry. So if, if you're doing combined science, you don't need to know titrations. If you're doing IGCSC combined science, you don't have to do the titration. If you're doing IGCSC chemistry or you're doing AQA chemistry, then you need to know about the titrations. It all depends. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, someone said, can we go through the uh, carbon allotropes? Uh, yeah, let me go. Oh, all right, let's quickly whiz through carbon allotropes. Um, everyone's got to know carbon allotropes, so I don't want to like... Um... Okay, so your allotropes of carbon, you've got three allotropes of carbon that you need to know. Does anyone know the names of the three allotropes of carbon? Actually, I think there's actually four that... Um, yeah, there's kind of four that you need to know. Anyone know the allotropes of carbon? So, if you're wondering what an allotrope is, it is just um, a substance made of the same element, but the particles are arranged in a different way. So we've got diamond, we've got graphite. <clears throat> For some of you, you need to know graphene. And we've got fullerene, also known as buckyballs or buckminster fullerene. And we've got nanotubes. <coughs> That's kind of five allotropes, but really nanotubes are fullerene. So nanotubes are fullerene. So um, <clears throat> they've just been rolled into a tube. Right, so what do you need to know? Let me zing through what you guys have got to know. So <clears throat> diamonds, each carbon atom is bonded to four others. And I'm not going to draw the whole thing out, but is... Um, all of these are made of carbon. So do you think they will have covalent bonds or ionic bonds or metallic bonds? What type of bonding do you think will be in these? So graphene hasn't come up in IGCSE chemistry, but graphene, they can still ask you a question on it because it's very similar to graphite. So they'll give you a little bit of extra. Yeah, there's no valence electrons in diamonds. So what you're going here is uh, they are all they all have covalent bonds because they're non-metals. And never, ever, ever, guys, this is a big thing for tomorrow. Don't ever say there's a weak bond. Covalent bonds, seriously strong. The actual strongest bonds of them all. Then we have ionic bonds, very, very strong. Uh, then we have metallic bonds. Very, very strong. All of those bonds are strong. The only thing that's weak in chemistry is intermolecular forces. So the moment you're going to say weak bond, you're about to write it's because it's got weak bonds. Check yourself. 
you're writing it wrong. Okay, doesn't matter if it's a gas, if it's got a covalent bond, they're incredibly strong. So all of these have covalent bonds and you all, regardless of exam board, need to know the definition. Who knows the definition of a covalent bond? In IGCSE, this is really common for them to ask for this definition. So who knows the definition of a covalent bond? Anyone know the definition of a covalent bond? So a covalent bond is a strong electrostatic attraction. Electrostatic is for all of them. Okay. Very good, Lloyd. The shared pair of electrons. Yeah, shared pair of electrons. Not between atoms. Between nuclei. Oh, nice. The last one there is very good. Strong electrostatic attraction between nuclei and shared electrons. If you're asked why something has a high melting point and it's covalent, you can say because it has strong electrostatic attraction between nuclei and shared pairs of electrons and lots of strong bonds, lots of energy to break. And that's going to smash the marks. Anytime they ask, why has this got a high melting point or high boiling point? You're going to see a question tomorrow, 100% guaranteed, as I'll give you a million pounds. 100% um, guaranteed saying, why has this a high melting point? Why has this a high boiling point? And the answer is, it's a, got a giant structure. Regardless of whether it's metallic, covalent or ionic, great if you know that and you know the definition, put that down. But if you say it has a giant structure, lots of strong bonds, lots of energy to break, you're going to pull off loads of marks. So let me quickly zip through these. Diamonds... Um, no free electrons, cannot conduct electricity. Each carbon atom is bonded to four others. Um, graphite, each carbon atom is bonded to three others. Okay. And graphite is in layers. And in between the layers, it has weak intermolecular forces. There's no covalent bond here for diamond, just uh, for graphite, sorry. Weak intermolecular forces. Carbon has four electrons in the outer shell, and um, with graphite, three of them are bonded in covalent bonds, and one electron is hanging loose. So this gives graphite great properties, and it's very likely that you'll be asked about graphite. You could be asked, why does it conduct electricity? The answer is, if you're studying AQA, OCR, or Red Excel, it's the answer is... It has delocalized electrons that carry charge through the structure. If you're studying IGCSE, they're really tight and they don't give you a mark for carry charge through the structure. So you say it has delocalized electrons that are free to move and conduct electricity. So it's a slightly different answer depending on what exam board you're doing. Both of them you need to point out that it has delocalized electrons. If you're asked why graphite is soft, does anyone know why graphite is soft? And why it, when you write with a pencil, when you scribble with a pencil, it comes off on the paper. Why does the graphite come off on the paper? And why is it a lubricant? Anyone know why graphite's soft? It's arranged in layers. The layers can slide. So for graphite, you want to say it has layers and the layers slide. Very good, Sophie. Yeah, the layers slide, but they slide because it has weak intermolecular forces. So if you say it has layers which slide, that's two marks. If they ask you why graphite's soft and it's three marks, then they want you to point out that there's weak intermolecular forces, easy to break in between the layers. That's why they slide. Right. For those of you that are wondering what the hell is graphene, Uh, if you're wondering what is graphene, graphene is a single layer of graphite. So you just need to know the same things. You can't say it's arranged in layers because it's just a single layer. What scientists did is they cut one layer off. It conducts electricity, but it's very light. So the only thing you need to know about graphene is all the things you need to know about graphite. Each carbon atom is bonded to three others. It has delocalized electrons, but it's very light. So it, that's its kind of technological advantage over graphite. Right, fullerenes are like these weird balls made of... I can't draw a fullerene to save my life. They're made of like hexagons and pentagons. So it kind of looks like a football. 
fullerene is watch out for fullerenes they are actually simple molecules Ta -da! and they have the formula C60 so this can confuse some of you guys you might think hold on 60 carbon atoms that's a big ass molecule no it's pretty small uh, one diamond on a wedding ring will have trillions of atoms a fullerene molecule only has 60 atoms so it's simple molecule now it's a good lubricant because it has weak intermolecular forces so it makes it a good lubricant it cannot conduct electricity because it, the delocalized electrons are trapped in the ball of fullerene uh, it can be used to deliver medicines it's a good catalyst now nanotubes actually can conduct electricity they're like fullerenes they're rings of uh, fullerenes rolled up like this looks like a stent from anyway yeah nanotubes are um, rolled up they have a large sur they have a high surface area to volume ratio they are good lubricants again they can be used for delivering medicines and things like that so and they conduct electricity nanotubes um, I did a bit of salt preparation just a bit earlier let me just um, look at some of these questions uh, but, 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 because the attraction between the layers are weak yeah 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 slide over each other nice you've all got the graphite really cool the layers can slide weak into molecular forces states of matter particle diagrams yeah 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 I'll go through that can you explain ionic covalent bonding yeah and salt preparation we did a little bit um, can you guys see the whiteboard as it disappeared Oh, maybe my nanotube disappeared. I see what you're saying. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. I've only just seen it now. It's under my camera. Sorry. Nanotubes kind of look like that. Um, yeah, they're very similar to fullerenes. So lubricants. The only difference between a fullerene is a nanotube can conduct electricity. Um, high surface area to volume ratio. And they're good catalysts. Um, right. Cool, cool, cool. Right, 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 right. Let me hold on. Let me move on. Uh, someone was talking about ionic and covalent, uh, which is a bit long. Um, let me just do. Oh my God, that's the crappiest writing. All right, let's just. Uh... Okay, ionic bond definition, people. Um, ionic bond definition electrostatic oh my gosh attraction between oppositely charged ions so here is the definition of an ionic bond electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions so it's this this attraction they're all saying yeah we love each other okay there's an attraction here and that is an ionic bond okay between them so they're very strong they're not weak uh, cations anions yeah you can name them if it was magnesium and sulfur you'd say strong attraction between magnesium positive magnesium mg2 plus ions and sulfur 2 minus ions if it was magnesium and oxygen you could say strong electrostatic attraction between magnesium positive magnesium ions and negative oxygen ions but it's easier just to say oppositely charged ions now, all ionic substances, um, all ionic, by the way, does everybody know how to spot an ionic substance? Yes, uh, little misbeliever, it's a metal and a non-metal. That means it's an ionic compound. And that means that what you need to say, giant structure, and the moment any time you write the words giant structure, follow it with lots of strong bonds. This is where I would bust out the definition, electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. Lots of strong bonds. And then I would say lots of energy needed to break. Okay. And that is tons of marks right there. When would you write this answer? You would write this answer when they say to you, 
and you've all seen these questions, right? You're going to score like four marks. The question would be anything along the lines of, why does sodium chloride have a high melting point? Here's your four marks. Strong electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. Giant structure. Lots of strong bonds. Need lots of energy to break. Four marks. You could be asked, why is sodium chloride solid at room temperature? Same answer. Electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. Strong bonds. Lots of energy to break. Giant structure. So you need to put all of that in. Now, if you're looking at covalent... Does anyone know the clue? How do you know if something is a covalent substance? We already did the definition of this. You guys came up with it. The covalent bond, you start it off the same, guys. They all start the same. Electrostatic attraction between shared pairs of electrons and nuclei. So it's the electrostatic attraction between shared pairs of electrons and nuclei. Notice the similarity. Both electrostatic attraction, but they're between two different things. Um, yeah, Zainab, if, it's, if you're aware that it's an ionic bond and you've worked it out and you're like, yes, it's metal and non-metal, then put the electrostatic attraction, strong bond between oppositely charged ions, fine, electro... But if you don't, you will still get the marks by saying, hey, giant structure, lots of strong bonds, lots of energy needed to break. Um, so the moment you know it's a non-metal, I did electrolysis earlier. You can rewind the live, guys. If you want to check out electrolysis, I did it earlier. So that's about like, you can just re you can just slide the bar back and rewatch. I spent about 10, 15 minutes doing electrolysis. Um, so... Covalent substances, unlike ionic, they come in two, two structures, right? The two structures of covalent substances are simple and giant. So giant, how do I know whether I'm talking about a giant covalent or a simple covalent? Giant covalent, like diamond, silicon dioxide, graphite. These are giant covalent, right? There's another clue for giant covalent. All giant structures have high melting points, whether they're ionic or covalent. And all giant structures, you can't be a giant structure and be a gas or liquid at room temperature. So all giant structures are solid and um, high melting point and boiling point. So there's a little clue and they're hard. Yeah, yeah, silicon dioxide does have double bonds. Um, no, I don't think it's possible electro... Well, okay, so it depends what exam board you're doing. Someone said, is it possible that electrolysis won't come up? Well, um, electrolysis has come up every year for the last five years. I've gone through and I looked at the last five years. If you're doing AQA, there's been a question on electrolysis, like a 10 marker for the last five years. But that doesn't mean it's guaranteed to come up this year. Okay, this might be the year it doesn't come up, but it's up to you to take the chance. Um, it's come up every year, electrolysis. Um, it seems to be one. Chemistry is a little bit more like they ask a little bit of everything more than biology, um, where it's kind of random. Right, the other type of covalent substance is simple structure. What do you need to know about simple structures? Simple structures, hey, you can call them simple molecules. Some examples allow you to call them small molecules or just molecular substances, but the best word is simple molecules. They have weak intermolecular forces, little energy needed to break. There's never really been a chemistry exam where you haven't had to, there's, there's very rarely a chemistry exam where you don't have to comment on a simple molecule. Okay, so, Simple molecules. How do you know you're dealing with a simple molecule? Anyone know? What's the clue? Does anybody know the clue that you're dealing with a simple molecule? There's a clue in the question. When you've been given the question, by the way, take a highlighter in your exam. You can highlight the text of the question. It's really important. Don't highlight your work, your writing, but highlight the text. Um, how do you know that 
you're dealing with a simple molecule. Anyone in the chat? Anyone in the chat know, how do you know something is a simple molecule, has a simple structure? Very good, like that. It's a liquid or gas at room temp. Awesome, nice one, guys. Couple of things, low melting point, boom. Yeah, you guys are smashing it. So the moment they ask you a question saying, why does this have a low melting point? That's your answer. That's the mark scheme. Simple molecule, weak into molecular forces, little energy to break. Comes up nearly every year, but they could ask it like, why is carbon dioxide a gas? Means it's a simple molecule, weak into molecular forces, little energy needed to break or overcome the forces. Okay, so if they say, why does this have a low melting point? It's exactly the same answer every year. It's a simple molecule. Any gas, any liquid you can think of, nitrogen, oxygen, water, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, ammonia, hydrogen chloride, these are all gases and liquids they all have low melting on boiling points they're all simple molecules don't make the mistake um yeah the forces are broken when melted guys don't make the biggest mistake is people say they have weak bonds just get it out your head there's no such thing as a weak bond the um i just want to go through one thing here guys when you look at diamonds which is the hardest naturally occurring substance on the earth the bond here in diamond when we're trying to break it. Hey, carbon dioxide, the covalent bond in carbon dioxide is just as strong, if not stronger. The bonds in carbon dioxide are stronger than that of diamond. Why is carbon dioxide a gas and why is diamond a solid? Why is diamond hard and carbon dioxide a gas? It's because we're not breaking the bonds in carbon dioxide. If we want to melt or boil carbon dioxide, we're just overcoming weak intermolecular forces. So never say that bonds are weak. A similarity between all these molecules is they've got strong bonds. The difference with diamond is you're breaking trillions, many, 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 many strong covalent bonds in order to melt it. With carbon dioxide, you're just pushing the molecules apart. Yeah, silicon dioxide is giant, so uh, I don't know about similar chemical properties. It has similar physical properties to diamond and graphite. So what I mean by that is silicon dioxide has a very, very high melting point. It's sand, basically. You can line it inside ovens, pizza ovens, um, and it can go to thousands of degrees and it won't melt. You can make aprons, you can make clothing, heat-proof, fireproof clothing and gloves to use on the barbecue with silicon dioxide. Um, it won't melt. And so the similarity to diamond is lots of strong bonds, lots of energy needed to break. Uh, the bonds are covalent, so electrostatic attraction between shared pairs of electron and nuclei that are hard to break, blah, blah, blah. Lots of strong bonds, giant structure. However, diamond and silicon dioxide both don't conduct electricity. Quick question. If you are asked this, why does blah blah not conduct electricity guys what's the answer to that yeah you can use break and overcome both the same yeah lots of strong bonds lucas yeah yeah lots of strong bonds listen if you can remember the definition of a covalent bond then it's a four mark question put that in there if you can't just say strong covalent bonds you may pick up all the marks if you can remember the definition lots of strong covalent bonds which is the electrostatic attraction between nuclei and shared electrons put that okay well done guys you need free ions or free electrons if something doesn't conduct electricity it ain't got those two things so no free ions so what we would say is no free ions no free electrons and the third point so charge cannot be carried through structure okay so you know what I'm going to ask you now there's two questions here don't get these mixed up they're different slightly different answers for each of these why does
Molten means melted. Sodium chloride conduct electricity. Why does melted sodium chloride conduct electricity? Um, why does solid copper conduct electricity? So these are two different answers, guys. Two different answers. Yep, that's good. Um, yeah, so the reason why we mention both with the do not conduct electricity is because to conduct, you need to have one or the other, but there's no substances that have both. So when we say, why does it conduct electricity, we need to specify. This one's a bit harder because instead of saying both, you have to get it right. And molten have no, as someone put up there, no free ions. Um, no free, oh, sorry, free ions. Free ions to carry charge. Now, if you're doing international GCSE, you just need to say, Ions are free to move and they conduct electricity. If you're doing AQA or um, the other examples, you say to carry charge. Why does solid copper conduct electricity? Right. They don't have free ions and free electrons. And if you say free ions and free electrons, guys, you'll lose one of the marks. So you need to say for metals and graphite, they have free electrons a better word is delocalized, but all examples except free electrons nowadays. So free electrons carry charge through the structure. Um, graphite and metals have free electrons and graphene. They don't have free ions. So there's two different answers depending on whether they ask you about melted, ionic or solid copper. Um yeah, you need free ions or delocalized electrons, Lucas, but don't say both. It's one or the other. So if you're an ionic and you, substance and you've been melted, you've got free ions. If you're a metal, if you're solid, solids that conduct electricity have free electrons. So make sure you say that. Okay. Monomers and polymers. Depends which exam board you're doing. Are you doing AQA or Edexcel or IGCSE? So Zainab, they're delocalized because um, the metallic structure is like this. Let me just quickly answer Zainab's question. So you've got like, these are the metal ions. What happens? Let's pretend this is sodium. Sodium is in group one. It has one electron in its outer shell. And what's actually happening is sodium's like hey look i've got one electron in my outer shell um if you've got one electron in your outer shell sodium's like i'm not stable so what metals do to get around this is they go hey i'm going to chuck my electron over to him then this one says i'm not having the electron i want to be stable chucks its electron over to there and then this one says nah you're joking i don't i want to be stable and so what they're doing they end up forever just passing their electrons around each other. And we call this a C of electrons or D local, meaning they're not local. If they were local, they'd be in the shell, but they're not local. They're D local. So they've been kicked. It's like being kicked out of the house, go to your mate's house. And then that parent kicks you out. You go to the net and you all just keep going around each other's houses. So the electrons are moving around. And what they can do is they can carry current or charge. And in AQA, they like you to say charge the free electrons carry charge through the structure. So, and graphite has free electrons moving around and can carry charge as a solid as well. Now, um, just looking at some of the questions. Um, <clears throat> depends which exam board you're doing for. Um, okay, uh, Broski, AQA, uh, polymers and monomers appear in paper two if you're doing AQA. However, polymers come up in paper one in terms of plastics. So you just need to know one thing about polymers you need to know for paper one if you're studying AQA is just that plastics are polymers and 
they have weak intermolecular forces between the chains of plastic. There's long chains of plastic, like layers, and they have weak intermolecular forces known as crosslinks between the chains. However, the bigger the polymers, the more crosslinks they have. And a plastic with lots of crosslinks, so I've got my plastic cup here, um, a plastic that doesn't melt, I can put this in the microwave and it doesn't melt. This has a lot of crosslinks or stronger intermolecular forces than a crisp packet, which would melt really easily. So you just need to know they're the same, but some have stronger crosslinks or intermolecular forces than other ones. Essentially, plastics are still simple molecules, but they're just very, very big. So they got like stronger forces, which is why they're solid, but they still melt fairly easily. Um, yeah, polymers and monomers are mainly paper too when you're talking about addition polymerization and condensation polymerization. Um, liquid particle diagram. Right. Um, all right. Right. Liquid particle diagram. So here is. That's a good point. If you're studying combined science AQA, They've never asked a six marker on states of matter. States of matter has barely come up, so it could be the year. There's always a, a things that come up that don't normally come up. So <clears throat> here's a solid. What are the five things you need to you need to really describe five things about a solid if you're asked in a six marker, and they would be strong forces. Of attraction, I'm I'm bullet pointing. I can't like I don't know why my writing's coming out like um like some super large right. Strong forces um, vibrate. Um, no space. I'm not sure if they asked. I went through the papers and I couldn't find like a big one where they asked for solid, liquid, and gas. But maybe uh, strong forces between the particles, the particles vibrate in a solid, no space, uh, low energy. Um, yeah, right. Let's look. There's probably something I've missed out there. Li but you're looking at really just um, liquids. You kind of, if you're drawing the liquid diagram, you want them touching, but not in a regular pattern. You kind of want them touching because what liquids can do is move around each other but they're still touching. So for liquids, we really want to say weak forces between the particles. Um, random movement. The movement's random. We can't predict which way each liquid particle is going to move. It's totally unpredictable. Um, faster than solids. Like more kinetic energy, more energy. Yeah, right. I'm just going to leave it at that because, um, and then gases are sort of zipping about everywhere. So they've got the biggest space, the most energy. And for some strange reason in the particle model, we say no forces or negligible forces, random arrangement, random movement, um, high kinetic energy, or they're traveling the fastest. <coughs> Biggest spaces between the particles as well. Um, so, you could be asked about the limitations of this model. What are the limitations of this model? When I look at this particle here, let's imagine... This is water particles. Let's imagine I'm doing water. Actually, that wouldn't be water. That would be ice. So scrap that. Let's imagine that would be water and that would be steam. What can't we tell about water, ice and steam from the solid, liquid and gas model? You need to know the limitations of this model. What can't we tell, guys? Very good. Yeah, Lucas, we can't tell the size. It's 2D. We can't tell if they're, they look like spheres. What does water actually look like? Water is actually like this. So they're not spheres. Water is actually looks like that. Each one of these is supposed to be made of three atoms. 
with bonds. We can't see the bonds inside the particles. We can't see the covalent or ionic bonds. So we want to say, we can't see the bonds. This gives the impression they're round. They're not round. Water is not a round molecule. Water actually is shaped like this. It's like a V shape or a bent shape. So it's not actually round. Um, we can't see the bonds. We can't see the electrons. We, we got no idea about any of that stuff. We can't tell the size of the forces from looking at it. So there's all those things and we don't know the relative sizes. Yeah, cool. Good, good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't show the forces. Yeah, you got it. You got it. You got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's A-level, right? You don't need to know that, uh, Niha. Um, that's A-level. Yeah, it's a bent molecule. Yeah, it doesn't show. You don't, yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't have to know the 104.5 degrees. Luckily. So, let me just see what else people are saying. Half equations. We kind of did half equations back with anonymous with electrolysis. Yeah, if you're, um, Niha, if you're asked to do, um, if you're asked to do, calculate the rate, if it's of a specific point, then you have to do a tangent. Um, so you might, but that's in paper two in AQA. So it depends whether you're doing IGCSE or AQA. That would be paper two. So I don't want to go over rate today. Um, now, yeah, lattice we can use for solid. Le Chatelier's principles. Broski, are you doing IG, international GCSE or AQA? So it depends what you're doing because Le Chatelier is, is only coming up if you're doing IGCSE tomorrow. One sec. How do I bust this out? Okay, right. So, okay, just going to quickly go through a bit of the uh, moles. Well, at Excel, let's have a look. It might be tomorrow. Let's have a look. Paper one. Ed Excel does do um, so. Ed Excel. <laughs> you got dynamic equilibrium. That's thirteen. Yeah, you're right. That's coming up tomorrow. Uh, Le Chatelier's principle. Yeah, I might do that after. Hold on. Um, it's not in AQA till um, after um, half term. Let me just go through moles because that's definitely. Uh, most people have got that tomorrow. Okay, moles. So you've got like, it could be given, uh, the mo basically in your paper, the moment someone says grams, the moment you see grams on the paper, you highlight it with your paper, your brain needs to be switching to this is probably about moles. So if I say something like, oh, I've got six grams of, if I'm reading a question, it could have a whole paragraph of dirty information, but I see somewhere in that paragraph, I highlight, oh, it said six grams of magnesium. You're more than likely going to have to calculate the moles of magnesium. Now, um, magnesium reacts with, um, let's do oxygen like so and it forms I've done this is a really easy version I'm doing here okay because I'm ah oh, that's that's going to be a problem if you can't see that let me rewrite that over here so let's go m g okay m g o now essentially we need to balance this up. So we're going to put a two here and a two here. So balancing is a whole other thing. Probably a bit late to learn your balancing. Um, if there's six grams of magnesium, they might ask you a reacting mass question. And it would go something like this. 
um, calculate the maximum mass of magnesium oxide that can be obtained. Okay guys, so calculate the maximum mass of magnesium oxide obtained. How would you do this? Yes, Broski, molecular mass is the same as relative formula mass. The reason why there are two different um, definitions of molecular mass and relative formula mass is because molecular mass originally was, we use it for everything. I use MR for everything, whether it's magnesium, oxygen, MGO, but specifically we should really be saying AR, atomic mass, for magnesium. And for magnesium oxide, because it forms a giant ionic lattice, there's no such thing as a molecule of magnesium oxide. There are no molecules of magnesium oxide. They don't exist. Um, it exists in a giant lattice. So technical chemists say, right, you should call that RFM, meaning it's the relative formula mass. It's the relative of just one unit of a giant ionic structure. But that's just technicalities. MR, RFM, AR, they kind of all mean the same thing. Add up the mass numbers. So yeah, the equation is moles. The equation that you need to know off by heart. The most important equation in chemistry. You will get your level seven if you if you can just do um, mass. Oh, sugar. He says he can't even type it out. Mass equals Mr. Times moles. Uh, that can be RFM, AR, whatever you want to call it for Mr. Mass equals Mr. Moles. You put the mass at the top in a triangle if you like triangles. So first thing we're going to do here, we've got six grams of magnesium, guys. Um, What's the moles of magnesium? So the moment you see grams, start working out moles. So six grams over the MR. Where do I find my MR? You will be given a periodic table. Don't be lazy. Turn to your periodic table. Find magnesium and find its mass. Magnesium is 24. They normally give it to you in brackets. Even better than you know I'm definitely doing moles. So six over 24. What does that equal? Is that 0 0.25? So, you got 0 0.25 moles. What's the next step, guys? Well done, Sana. Uh, 0 0.25. What are you going to do now? That's your magnesium. You're now going to go to the equation at the top of the page. You're going to draw an arrow. Most people, if you can just, if you're crap at moles and you can just see grams and divide by the MR, you're going to get one out of three or one out of four. And that might be good enough because you can pick up marks on other areas, right? But if you can do this next step, this is the step that people struggle with. We look at the ratio of magnesium to magnesium oxide. You're um, once you know the moles of one thing in an equation, you know the moles of everything else. The ratio is 2 to 2, which I can simplify to 1 to 1. Just by writing the ratio, you probably are going to secure yourself the second mark. So the ratio is 1 to 1, 2 to 2 or 1 to 1. This means that I have 0 0.25 moles of MgO as well. So now you've used the ratio and that scores the second mark. Sometimes they're four marks, but um, we've used the ratio. It's identical. Now I need to work that equation backwards. I need to work this equation. I can work out the MR. You always have the MR in the toolbox because it's on your periodic table. The MR is 40. So you're going to do Mr. times moles 0 0.25 times 40. So you divide with the first one, you times once you do the ratio to work back to the mass. And we go 0 0.25 times 40. I should be making 10 grams of magnesium oxide. And that's our answer. Uh, no. By the way, guys... These numbers, let me get this out here in the open. 
for tomorrow's exam. These numbers, the balancing numbers, we call them coefficients, whatever you want to call them. These numbers in chemistry that you find in equations that we balance, they serve one purpose and one purpose only. You do not use them for working out MR. You do not use them for anything else other than the ratio when doing mole equations. So if I know the moles of magnesium, I know the moles of oxygen, I know the moles of everything else. It means if you calculate the moles of one thing, you know the multiplier to work out everything else. That's all they're there for. You don't need them for anything else. Yeah, 10 grams. Yeah, well done, 10 grams. Now, guys, let's say I said, let's say I said you only made, you actually made, eight grams. Right guys, if you actually made eight grams, what is the percentage yield? Does anyone know what the percentage yield is if you actually only made eight grams? Yeah, I will do another one. What's the percentage yield if you made only eight grams? Those of you that have to do percentage yields. They then follow up. We call this reacting mass. You do this reacting mass equation to work out what you should make. And then they'll follow it, hit you. If you've got yield in your exam board, they'll hit you with yield afterwards to say you actually made this. And then you divide that. Yeah, it's 80%. Well done, Ahmed. Um, yeah, it's 8 over 10 uh, uh, times 100. And you got 80%. Right, let's do another one. Well, I'm going to make this one. I, I made that a one-to-one -one ratio to start with. Let's do one slightly harder than that. Okay. Um, yeah, actual over theoretical times 100. That's right. So let's do a different one. Um, okay. Oh, shit. Uh, Oh my god. Um yeah. Need to balance that. Uh, it's already balanced, isn't it? That's annoying. I don't really want to do that. That equation's a bit dumb. Let me not do that one. Um let's clear that. Let's not do that. That was a Randomly bad equation to do. Let's do. Okay. It's falling apart. Right. Um. Let's do one that is definitely. Okay. So iron plus oxygen goes to. F E two so this is a bit better because the ratio is not going to be straightforward. So I need to do two lots of that. I need a four here and I need a three here to balance. I'm just gonna circle these. These guys are the coefficients or you just call them the ratio numbers. They're balancing numbers, but in a mole question, these are just for working out ratios, okay? Um, is it okay now? Can you see the, uh, can you see the FE203 now, now that I've cleared it and gone with FE203? <clears throat> so what I'm going to say is you got 50 grams of Fe I could change it up and say um, how much 
oxygen is needed to completely react with 50 grams of Fe. change that to okay what mass of oxygen is needed to completely react with 50 grams of Fe oh sorry I can do energetics if you want yeah um, what have I got if I move that down Is any of it missing? Mm. Oh no, I didn't. This isn't a limiting one. Uh, uh, sugar. I don't know why that's so covered up. That shouldn't be covered up. I wonder how I actually can. Can I select? This is my first time using this Google thing. Do you know what? Let me just clear that that was a bit let me write it over here so F E so what did we have we had four F E plus uh three O two goes to two F E two O three now what we've got here Okay, I said there's 50 grams. I didn't really ask about limiting, but I could, if you want, I'll do. I'll change it into a limiting one. Um, um, if you want, I'll change it into a limiting one. So how we'll do this? I'll say we've got 50 because sometimes limiting reactants come up, but then that might. Let me just do a normal one. Okay, so if you have 50 grams of iron. Um, Let's just say how much iron oxide will be made. Uh, okay. I'll do limiting after. Okay. I actually did electrolysis. If you go back to 55 minutes, I did electrolysis then. So you can check out electrolysis then. I will go through strong and weak acids. I'm just going to do one more. Let me whiz through because I'm going a bit slow. Um, so, mass. This is the most important one out of all your equations for chemistry. It's the, like, there's never been a chemistry exam where you haven't had to do mass equals Mr. Moles. Okay. Yeah, so iron is like uh, 56. So, we're going to go 56 as the MR. We got 50 grams, so we want to divide 50 by 56. Now, if you're, I like to write everything out so I don't forget what I'm doing. And this is giving me, I'm just going to round here, this is going to give me 0 0.89 moles. Some people like to use an N for number of moles. If they put M, it gets confusing. Uh, Okay, yeah, I'll go through some of these after. Okay, sorry, Sana. Uh, yeah, I'll go through that after. Um, so, 0 0.89 moles of iron. I then go here, and I the two things in my question, there's no mention of oxygen there. By the way, don't get thrown off if they say iron reacts completely in oxygen to form iron oxide. Calculate how much iron oxide will be made from 50 grams. They might mention oxygen in the question, but it's not integral. You only need two things in a mole calculation. You only need the first one and the second one that they ask you to find out. So we found out the moles of Fe. This is moles of Fe. We then use the ratio is 4 to 2. That's all these numbers are for. They're for ratioing in mole equations. So we go 4 to 2. So instead of timesing, I'm going to divide this by 2. And this is going to give me 0 0.44 moles or 0.446 moles. If I want, I can round that to 0 0.45. So I'm going to round to 
for five moles. <coughs> now I know the moles of Fe two O three. I need to turn it back into mass to answer the question. And to turn it back into the mass, I come back to this equation and I go 0 0.45 times the MR Fe203. And that is 2 times 56 is 112 plus 48. Y48, 3 O's, 3 16's are 48. So I'm going to multiply 0 0.45 by 160, which is the MR. And times 160... I get 71, like 0.4 grams. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, and then you check it in your head. You say, well, if I added oxygen to something, would it get heavier? And the answer is yes. So I'd expect it to go up from 50 to 71.4. Yeah, it's probably 71.36 with my crappy uh, maths there. But yeah. So, well done. Yeah, so that's a reacting mass equation. I just wanted to do that one. Let me just quickly do a limiting reactance one, guys. You may get a limiting reactance equation. So, let me just clear that. Limiting reactions equation is going to look like this. So, a limiting reaction equation, I'm actually just going to do the one we used earlier, um, like that. And, and then... Oh, Tom, why did you do that? You ain't left room for a two, have you? Okay, that's like the worst written equation in the history of equations. So, here's the question. If you have 48 grams of magnesium... Now, limiting reactants is what it says on the tin. You know it's going to be limiting reactants. So they give you the two reactants. So if you have 48 grams of magnesium that reacts with um, <coughs> 33 grams, 34 grams, no, can I type? That would be nice. 34 grams. Uh, 34 grams of oxygen. So if you have 48 grams of magnesium that reacts with 34 grams of oxygen, what would be the limiting reactant? So you could get a limiting reactant question like this. Um... Uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Quadruple, no, Heptilit or whatever, six Gs is. No, you don't want to times 56 by 4. The, the coefficient number... Uh, no, I cleared the frame. Okay, the, these numbers here, you do not... These, you do not use these numbers for... M calculating MRs. They're nothing to do with the MR. They are simply for ratioing when you're doing a mole equation. Don't use them in the MR, okay? So, um, what you want to do here, guys, you, the moment I see this, I've been given 48 grams of magnesium and 34 grams of oxygen. I want to say, right, I need to calculate the moles of each. So, the first thing to do is the moment you see grams, start calculating moles. You're going to secure yourself marks. So moles of magnesium, you look up in the periodic table and you find out what the MR of magnesium is. Um, most probably, they'll give you, they might be really nice and give you the ARs. So I'm going to give you the ARs. Magnesium equals 24. And oxygen is 16. Okay. <laughs> right, Nihat, you're right. So 48 over 24. We've got two moles 
of magnesium. And for oxygen, we've got 34 over 24. So we go 34 divided by 24 equals 1.41. Now, why did I do 34 over 24? I have no idea. My brain's not working fully at all. Sorry, guys gone completely insane now we don't do it over 16 we don't do it over 16 we do this over 32 why do we do that over 32 we do it over 32 because the we've got a diatomic molecule oxygen so let me just zing that in the old calculator 32 uh, 34 divided by 32 you got one point oh my gosh 1.06 I could have made it a little bit easier 1.06 moles so at first appearance you are tempted to say <coughs> now it's 34 over 32 because oxygen's MR is 32 okay so 34 divided by 32 is 1.06 Now, what you need to do, you would look at that, and most people would say, which one is limiting? If you look at this, I've got two moles of magnesium, only one mole, or just over one mole of oxygen. Which one is limiting? You'll be tempted to say it's magnesium, but it's not. Because I need, I need double the magnesium than I have of oxygen, because the ratio is two to one okay and I don't have double I've got under double so in this situation magnesium is limiting so you have to take into account the ratio all right I think that's enough on moles moles are gonna like <coughs> drive me mad yeah um, by the way uh, this here is oxygen Okay, Niha, we don't divide by 16 because it's O2. So, um, <laughs> yeah, you can use the big number in front in atom economy. You're right, um, Ali, you use the big number in atom economy, but you use the big number for ratioing as well in reacting masses, but you don't use it for, um, yeah. You don't use it for um, working out MR. Um, no, if I was doing the moles of magnesium to magnesium oxide, I only circled that number. We're not actually looking at this one. We're looking at oxygen in this question, magnesium to oxygen, because it's a limiting reactance question. We're not looking at magnesium to magnesium oxide. But if I was talking about magnesium to magnesium oxide, then it would be a two to two. And if I had two moles of magnesium, I'd make two moles of magnesium oxide. But in this one, we're saying... I've given you how much magnesium we've got, 48 grams, and I've given you how much oxygen, 34 grams, and I'm saying, which one do we not have enough of to use up all of the reactants? And it looks at first, we go, okay, I've got two moles of magnesium, and I've only got 1.06 moles of oxygen. So it looks at first that I've got more magnesium than oxygen. But in terms of the reaction, I don't, because mag you need to have double the amount. And if I go two times 1.06, I need to have 2.12 moles of magnesium to use up all the oxygen. So at the end of this, there's a tiny bit of oxygen left over, basically. Right. Um, yeah, you're right. 2 divided by 2 gets 1, and it's lower than 1.06. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So if I divide 2 by 1, yeah, if 2 by 2, yeah. Well, if I divide, divide divide it down one 
you need one mole of oxygen to react with two moles of magnesium. But I've got more than one mole of oxygen, so I would need more magnesium. You could say oxygen is in excess. At the end of this reaction, there'll be 0 0.06 moles of oxygen left over, basically. Um, all right, um, I think I might finish up. Let's just see. Um, <clears throat> what else, what else, what else? Someone was saying, what else, what else, what else? All right, let me do another, I'll do another limiting reactants question quickly. All right, um, let's do a quick number of limiting reactants. So we can do, okay, so for those of you doing hydrogen fuel cells tomorrow, can you actually all see that? Can you see that at all? Um, electrolysis, I did at 55 minutes. Uh, Manny, you can just switch back the chat, to, uh, slide back it to 55 minutes. Um, so what you got here, hydrogen plus oxygen makes water. So yeah. If you're doing triple AQA, you need to know about hydrogen fuel cells, by the way. Hydrogen donates electrons um, to create current, which powers the motor. And this is the overall equation for the hydrogen and the oxygen, which you need to know for fuel cells. And you just need to know as well with hydrogen fuel cells, if you're doing chemistry triple tomorrow AQA, you need to know with hydrogen fuel cells that their only product is water. So they don't produce the carbon dioxide. So that's good news. Um, they don't rely on fossil fuels directly and um, they don't produce any toxic substances like batteries and rechargeable batteries that produce toxic waste. So that's really good. The downside is that hydrogen is a gas at room temperature um, and so it needs to be compressed into a liquid. It's hard to store, hard to transport, very expensive. And also, where do we get hydrogen from? When you have a fuel cell, where do you get hydrogen from? Well, we get it from cracking alkanes. So that is using up fossil fuels. Our, or we get it from electrolysis of H2O. You can reverse this equation and break H2O down into hydrogen. And if you do that, that's expensive. It requires electricity. We all know about the price of the electricity bill. And it also releases carbon dioxide when you make use electricity. So in a way, hydrogen isn't as clean a fuel as we think. So you just have to be able to compare that to using batteries, basically, if you're doing AQA triple tomorrow. Anyway, this is a limiting reactant question. So I'm just going to say, like, if I've got eight grams of hydrogen, so if I have, um, I need to type because when I write, it's so slow, eight grams of hydrogen. Um, why the hell was that there? Okay. So if we've got eight grams of hydrogen and um, let's say reacts with 32 grams. Now let's make it 60. No, let's make it 32 grams of oxygen. Um, and then I could either ask you what's in it. Um, show which one is the limiting reactant so when we're talking about limiting reactants here guys we're only talking about the reactants these limiting questions or excess questions are only about them so we only need to focus on these two and we need to look at the ratio and the ratio again is two going to one it's not always two to one a lot of the time it's one to one um, so it's two to one so what I need to do is I've been given the grams. For those of you that are like, I am completely baffed by limiting reactants and all of this, what you can do is just remember that you can pick up a lot of marks from just knowing mass equals Mr. times moles. And all you need to do here is say to yourself, well, I'm going to just try and calculate the moles of each of these. 
Now they will give you the A, they normally give you the AR, which is like the MR. So of hydrogen is one and of O equals 16. But then we've got to be aware that they're diatomic molecules. They come in twos. So um, you've got to be aware that Hydrogen has a mass of two. So see if you can work this out. What are the moles of each? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we want to go eight over two for hydrogen. We have four moles of hydrogen. Some of you might think, but sir, there's a big two in the equation. Doesn't that mean I've got two moles? No, that's the ratio. Those big numbers you put in the equation are the ratios. They're, they're used for reacting mass equations or atom economy equations. The moles is actually here. So I've got, I've got um, four moles of hydrogen, eight divided by two. And I've got 32 over one. What am I doing? 32 over one, joker. 32 over two, which equals one mole of oxygen. So what that tells me, why is oxygen 32? Because it's O2, so it's 2 times 16. The atom is 16. A molecule of oxygen has a mass of 32. So 32 over 32 equals 1. So I've got four times the hydrogen than I needed the oxygen. I only needed double. So hydrogen's in excess. Oxygen is limiting. Okay, And we could even calculate how much hydrogen would be left over. So we would say... Um, yeah, there's going to be two moles of hydrogen left over because I need it two to one. So I've got one mole of oxygen. That's going to react with two moles of hydrogen. I'm going to be left with two moles of hydrogen, which is four grams. So you could work out exactly the mass of how much hydrogen's left over. Or you could work out, and that's in excess, and the oxygen is limiting here. We're expecting a ratio of two to one, and we got four to one. So we have extra hydrogen than we need, and that's limiting reactants. I did reacting mass a little bit before. Um, I haven't done flame tests. Um, flame tests. I'll just talk you quickly through flame tests. Flame tests. Um, yeah, they're not coming up for everybody. But there's lithium, sodium, potassium. Hold on. Yeah, lithium, sodium, potassium, copper, calcium. So these are the five metals you need to know for the flame tests. And how do you carry out a flame test? You need to know for, if you're doing the flame test tomorrow, you need to know that you use a platinum wire. Some of you won't be doing the flame tests till, depending on your exam board, till... Um, if you're doing AQA, you don't need flame tests tomorrow. But if you're doing IGCSE or some of the other examples, you do you use a platinum wire for two reasons. So the two marks for the platinum wire, it's um, high melting point, so it's not going to melt and drip all over your arm when you stick it in a fire. High melting point. Um, and does not give off a flame. So it doesn't give off a flame. That's important because... The platinum wire, I don't want it to block the colours of the flames. Otherwise, it's going to mask my results. So you can just say it's going to mask your results. What do you do? You dip wire in hydrochloric acid, removes impurities. So this will just take one second, removes impurities. Then place in flame and again that's going to burn off the hydrochloric acid gets rid of something called carbonates because acids and carbonates react so they get rid of any carbonates that are stuck on the wire and you stick it in the flame to burn everything off and evaporate it now you've got a clean platinum wire you're going to dip that in the sample you dip the platinum wire in the sample and you must place it in the non-luminous part of the flame what's the non-luminous you've all played around with bunsen burner flames at school obviously and the bunsen burner flame at school is blue like this and there's like a really blue bit you're going to put it in the light blue bit you're going to stick your um 
platinum wire in here so that you can see the flame. Now, if it's lithium, you're going to get a red flame. So you need to know that lithium, the flame goes red. If it's sodium, you're going to get a yellow flame. If it's potassium, I don't think I've got uh, on this crusty thing, I don't have the color. You get a lilac flame, you'll get away with saying purple. Uh, copper is blue, you can say blue green, blue green. And calcium is orange, or it used to be called brick red, but you can say orange red. Okay, and those are the color flames. They're the five metal ions you need to know. If they ask you what gave the red color, don't say lithium. You won't get the mark. It's lithium ions. If they ask you what gave the yellow flame, don't say sodium. It's sodium ions that gave the yellow flame. Okay, now the flame test is only part of your chemical analysis because that only tells you what the cation is. The cation will be joined with an anion, so you'd need to know the test for chloride ions, sulfate ions, etc., and carbonate ions. To, uh, Oliver, it depends if you are AQA or whether you are doing IGCSE. For IGCSE, you got to do the flame test tomorrow. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, looks a bit dodgy. Um, yeah, you can use chromium, you can use nichrome, you can use platinum. If you're doing the flame test tomorrow, you're probably an international GCSE student. You might be, and then you'll be using a platinum wire. Um, you can use chromium, yeah. Uh, or you just need to know that the boiling point or melting points of alkali metals decrease as you go down the group. You don't really need to know why. It's a bit A-level to know why they decrease going down the group. The size of the atoms increases. The metallic bonds become weaker as we go down the group. So um, the attraction between the delocalized electrons and the positive ions is weaker as we go down the group in the alkali metals. And actually, it's the same for group 2 metals. It's the same for group 3 metals. As you go down the group, the atoms get bigger. The electron, um, the, the outer electrons, which are the delocalized ones, get further from the nuclei. So you get a weaker metallic bond. That's really A level and you won't have to explain that. You just need to know that they decrease down the group. Non-metals, the boiling points and melting points, like for the halogens or group 6, which oxygen's in, they increase. And you can see that because they go from gas to liquid to solid. Oxygen's a gas, sulfur's a solid. Or if you look at chlorine's a gas, bromine's a liquid, iodine's a solid. So you can tell the boiling points are increasing for non-metals. It's sulfuric acid. Um, uh, no, it's not the intermolecular forces with alkali metals that are getting stronger. Intermolecular forces get stronger with the halogens as you go down the group. Intermolecular forces aren't what create our melting and boiling point for metals. It's metallic bonding. Metals don't really have intermolecular forces. They have, yeah, in GCSE we don't talk about them having intermolecular forces. Metals have metallic bonds which get stronger. I'm just going to finish up in a minute. I'm just going to finish with the um, acid and alkali, guys. Uh, Esra, um, for nanoparticles, someone's mentioned nanoparticles. Look, nanoparticles, dead easy. You just need to know they have a large surface area, and that gives them all of their properties, nanoparticles, is that they have a high surface area to volume ratio. There's a few examples specific to your example, but that's the main thing you need to know about nanoparticles is they have a high surface area to volume ratio. They're good as catalysts and various other things. The silver they use in socks to get rid of bad smells and things. But you have to just look for your exam board. Um, yeah, intermolecular forces and bonds I did a bit on earlier. I did a bit on intermolecular forces and bonds, someone's asked. Basically, intermolecular forces are always weak and are easy to break. Bonds are covalent, ionic, metallic, and they're always strong. If something has a low melting point or low boiling point, 
you are break you are trying to break its intermolecular some things we don't need to break their bonds if i want to separate so if i want to separate um where the hell right if i want to separate um this this is oxygen by the way it's got a double bond there's one oxygen and another if i want to turn oxygen into a gas this is an f off strong covalent bond right so never start talking about oxygen is a gas because it's got weak bonds you're completely wrong if you say that oxygen has got seriously strong covalent bonds those covalent bonds are stronger than any of them giant ionic ones they're seriously strong but if i want to make oxygen into a gas i'm not trying to break the bonds i'm just pushing one oxygen molecule away from another oxygen molecule so all i'm doing is pushing these oxygen molecules away from each other and I'll turn it into a gas and in between are dotted lines these represent weak weak forces that need hardly any energy to separate so we call these simple and we say they have weak intermolecular forces they only need a little energy to overcome or break the forces do not talk about breaking the strong covalent bonds in simple molecules now let's check uh, let's check out diamonds diamonds the oxygen bond is probably stronger than the bond in diamond i know you might think what the is diamonds the hardest substance on the earth and the bond in oxygen is stronger the covalent bond in diamond is seriously strong as well but the bond in oxygen is stronger the difference is when you want to melt diamond or boil diamond you have to break that covalent bond i'm not breaking that in oxygen i have to break this bond i have to break this bond i have to break this bond i need to heat diamond to four if you want to melt your mum or dad's engagement ring or wedding ring you're gonna to have to heat it to four thousand degrees to melt diamond you can't do that in your oven at home you'd need a volcano or you'd need to find the surface of the sun and throw it into the surface of the sun so and that's because I have to break lots of strong covalent bonds in a giant structure which contains billions of bonds, trillions of bonds. And I, I'm going to have to break those. So when I'm when something has a low melting boil or boiling point and is a liquid or a gas, anything that's a liquid or a gas has a simple structure. When I say anything that's a liquid or gas right now in the room with me now, my orange juice, anything that's a liquid or a gas like oxygen nitrogen has a simple structure with weak intermolecular forces that i need to break and they're that dotted line weak imf intermolecular forces if you've got a giant if you're giant metallic giant covalent like diamond or giant ionic like sodium chloride non-metal and metal then you have lots of strong bonds that you need to break in a giant structure which need lots and lots of energy hence the high melting points right um Yeah, you don't need to know about van der Waals forces. Uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> yeah, simple molecules have weak intermolecular forces. Don't talk about breaking the covalent bonds. They have very, very strong covalent bonds, simple molecules. So this is very strong. We don't want to talk about breaking that. We want to say... Um, we want to talk about breaking weak intermolecular forces. So that's what we want to talk about breaking. When you're breaking oxygen and melting it or boiling it, you are not breaking the strong covalent bonds. You are only breaking the weak intermolecular forces. So don't ever talk about weak bonds. Um, sorry, let me just do the pH calculation. I'm going to hit the hay in a minute because I am knackered. Um, right. This is really important and this could come up. Okay. Um, this is very, very important. So, John says a solution of pH 1 is stronger acid than pH 3. Is he correct? Why the hell is this coming out like giant haystacks? Super big. Right. Okay. John says the solution of pH 1 is stronger than pH 3. Is he correct? Six marks. Evaluate. 
So you could get something along these lines, which is talking about strong and weak acids. Is John correct? Uh, this comes up, so this bit is in Edexcel, OCR, and AQA. I can't confirm whether it's in all of your exams tomorrow. Um, it, this is in definitely in AQA. I've got the books in front of me, so I can tell you straight away if it's coming up tomorrow, to be honest. Yeah, it's coming up tomorrow if you're in Edexcel or AQA. I'd have to get my OCR book and have a look. So this is coming up tomorrow if you're in... Oh, there's my OCR gateway. Uh... Let the ass is um Yeah, this is coming up tomorrow for everyone. This is coming up tomorrow for everyone. The only people this is not coming up for is if you're doing international GCSE. This doesn't normally come up in international GCSE if you're doing IGCSE. So Okay, so guys, uh he's not correct. John is not correct. He could be correct. But he can't definitely say this. So he could be correct, but he might not be correct. And there's a reason. So let me explain what the reason is. So strong acids fully ionize in water. This is what a strong acid is. It's something that fully ionizes in water. Okay. Weak acid partially ionize in water, right? They partially come apart. Now, uh, if I want to do an equation for that, I can write a little equation for that, which would be like, so for a strong acid, they do this, okay? And if you've got a six marker, doing equations would be nice. I should put AQ on all of this. These are all aqueous. Acids are always in aqueous. A weak acid only partially ionizes. What we do for a weak acid, it does this. We have a reversible symbol, meaning it goes both ways. It doesn't fully ionize. Um, um, yeah, all right, that was a bit long. It's taking forever. Right, so strong acids fully ionize in water and weak acids partially ionize. Can I tell from his information that his pH 1 has fully ionized or his pH 3 has partially ionized. I can't tell from his information that, but you're right, someone mentioned pH's concentration. You're absolutely right. So I could say he might be right, but he can't definitely, I, I don't know for definite that he's right. And the reason being, pH, some people tell you, no one really in chemistry knows what pH stands for, but some people say it's the power of hydrogen. It's actually the log of the H plus ion concentration. So pH 1, uh, so we want to say pH, uh, is the H plus concentration. It's actually the log of the H plus concentration. So what does that mean? That means that if you have a pH of 1, you have a 0 0.1 mole per decimeter H plus concentration, right? That's what pH 1 means. What do you think pH 3, what is the concentration of pH 3? Anyone know what the pH uh, 3 So, <laughs> pH 3 is 0 0.001. Three zeros. So, the pH tells you how many zeros to stick on the concentration. So, what does this mean? This means that the solution, what John should have said, what John should have said, pH 1 has a 
stronger concentration than pH 3. And you can even give the factor. Someone was saying about the times 10 factor. How many zeros stronger is it? pH 1, if I'm going this way, from pH 3 to pH 1, it's 10 to the power of 2, or two zeros. So <coughs> 10 times 10, there's two differences there, pH 3 to pH 1. It's 100 times stronger. Two extra zeros, it's 100 times stronger pH 1 than pH 3. Concentration, a 100 times stronger concentration. It's not necessarily a stronger acid because I could have a weak acid with a 100 times stronger concentration. I can have a pH 1 weak acid. I can have a pH 3 strong acid. pH is the amount of hydrogen ions in the solution. Strong acid or weak acid just tells you do they fully break up or do only bits of them break up. And we use the word fully ionized or partially ionized. So some of the questions you could get, you could be asked, you've got a solution of pH 7, a solution of pH 5 or 4, how many times stronger it is. For every pH, it's a factor of times 10 going down is stronger in hydrogen ions going all the way up to pH 14. The strongest alkali is pH 14. You're going to write 14 zeros, 0.1. That's got hardly any hydrogen ions. It's an alkali, the strongest alkali. So pH 1, 0.1. Okay. Uh, this could be like a six mark question because there is a one more, one more bit that I can say. What John could say. Okay, here's what John could say. All right, good old John. He could definitely make this definite statement. What he should have said is, if you have two acids of the same concentration, what we mean by that is, if you have two acids that have the same concentration, the um, stronger acid will have a lower pH but that's quite a difficult concept to understand but if you had two acids of the strongest basically if I got one mole right if I got one mole all right if I got 0 0.1 mole ah, if I got 0 0.1 mole of HCl then I know when I put it in a, in water it will fully break up I know I'm going to have a pH 1 because I'm going to have 0 0.1 mole. It's all of it is going to break up and I'm going to have 0 0.1 mole of hydrogen ions. So with a strong acid, whatever the concentration of the acid is, that's the concentration of the hydrogen ions because every single one of them breaks into hydrogen ions. So if I have 0 0.1 mole of hydrochloric acid, it's going to be pH 1 because all of them are going to break. But if I have 0 0.1 mole, the same concentration of ethanoic acid which is a weak acid this is going to have a pH of like six or something hardly any of them are going to break up only one in a million are going to break up so I'm not going to have a, a, a high hydrogen ion concentration so if you have two acids of the same concentration the stronger acid will always have a lower pH um, but that's a complicated part to it really just know that strong acids fully ionized, weak acids partially ionized, and pH is a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration, not the acid concentration, the hydrogen ion concentration. Um, so, yeah, John can't officially say that. Okay. Whew. Um. Yeah, so concentration and strength. Here's the difference. Someone asked, what's the difference between concentration and strength? Concentration is the amount of hydrogen ions in a certain volume. We normally say per decimeter, which is a thousand centimeters a liter. So <clears throat> if, if I have 0 0.1 moles, it means I have, it's pretty complicated, but a tenth of Avogadro's constant, I have a certain amount of hydrogen ions in one litre. 
if you have 0.001 moles, then you've got less hydrogen ions in that litre. So there's less hydrogen ions in that litre. But when we're talking about strength, like strong acid and weak acid, we're talking about strong acids fully break up and weak acids only partly break up. But I could have a swimming pool of, F well, yeah, I could have a swimming pool of ethanoic acid and make it really strong or, but yeah. So, um, someone said plum pudding model. Um, I, I talked about fullerene earlier. Fullerene is a simple molecule. It's an allotrope of carbon. It's made purely of carbon. It's in a ball shape, has the formula C60. Uh, fullerene is used as a lubricant. It also can carry medicines around our body. Um, it's unreactive, so it's not going to be. To it's not toxic, so it's not going to damage you. It's not like carbon monoxide, which is going to stop oxygen in your blood. So they're trying to use it to carry medicines to destroy cancer cells or to live, deliver medicines to organs. It's a simple molecule, lubricant. It has weak intermolecular forces, even though it's a large simple molecule. It's got weak intermolecular forces, and it can't conduct electricity. It has delocalized electrons, but they're trapped, so it can't conduct electricity. And that's basically everything on fullerenes. Fullerenes are a um, an allotrope of carbon so they're like made of the same they're all made of carbon. Um, oh yeah uh, just before I finish because I'm knackered. Yeah just before I finish the plum pudding model for those of you if this comes up tomorrow plum pudding model right <laughs> I don't know what the fudge that is. It's a ball, two marks. What is the plum pudding model? Do you know what the plum pudding model is? Ask yourself, do you know? Uh, it's, it should, nowadays, plum puddings were things people ate 100 years ago. It came out, in, well, 150 years ago. It came out in 1897 by a guy called J.J. Thompson. And about that time, the kids on their way to school would eat plum puddings. Nowadays, people eat muffins and chocolate chip cookies from Subway. So it would be better to be called like the cookie model or the muffin model. And it's a ball of positive charge with negative, I don't know why I've used this pen, negative, they, I don't know what they look like, negative electrons stuck inside it. If you want to use the fancy term, you say embedded inside it. So if you're asked for two marks, what is the plum pudding model? Ball, you can say sphere if you like fancy words. Ball of positive charge with electrons. You can say negative charge if you don't want to say electrons. Stuck inside. You've got to imply that the electrons are not moving, so it's not the correct model. Like we know nowadays that electrons are moving about like flies around yeah, a dog poo. They're whizzing about like that. Um, um yeah. So this is the plum pudding model. Ball of positive charge with electrons stuck inside it. What do you need to know? A guy called Ernest Rutherford came along. And Ernest Rutherford, if you get a six marker on it, Ernest Rutherford, he fired... Um, Ernest Rutherford fired alpha particles that are positive like this at the plum pudding model. And what he expected... He expected the alpha particles to go straight through. These are the expected results. He expected the alpha particles to go straight through the plum pudding. Um, that's what he expected. What did he actually see? And you need to be able to compare the expected to what the actually observed results were. So expected was all of them to go through because alpha particles are very, very small, much smaller than gold atoms. They fired it at gold atoms, a sheet of thin gold metal. And what he actually found, and I'm literally going to finish after this, what they actually found is some of the alpha particles did this. Some of them went straight through. About 1 in 10,000 bounced back like that. Pretty small, right? And maybe 100 in 10,000 bent like that. And you need to know the reasons for each of those observations. So these are the observations for the plum pudding model. And you need to know those observations. So um, 
what did each of these observations prove? This proved atoms are empty space. They're mainly electron shells. So that proved atoms are empty space. This proved there's something small and hard or small and dense in the center. Later on, they found out that was the nucleus. So later on, they found out that was the nucleus, something small and dense in the middle. And then these are called deflections. And the deflections told us that the nucleus is positive. The positive alpha particles were repelled. So the positive alpha particles were repelled by the nucleus uh, tells us nucleus is positive. So there's three things Rutherford learned. There was something positive in the middle of the atom that could make alpha particles push away and bend away. And that's what the deflections told us. The fact that out of every 10,000 alpha particles they fired, like 9,000 went through, that proves that atoms are mainly empty space. And then one in 10,000 bounced straight back at him. And he said it was like firing a gun at a tissue, like someone holding a piece of paper and the bullet bouncing back. That's how shocked he was. And that told him that there's something incredibly hard and very small. If it wasn't small, then most of them would have bounced back. But the fact that only one in 10,000 bounced back means that most of it is empty space. So um, something very small and hard and dense in the center. And that's what the observations of the plum pudding model were. Um, they didn't later on find out about the structure we now know until other people had done experiments. A Danish scientist called Niels Bohr, he did loads of maths equations to prove that electrons actually orbit the nucleus in shells because otherwise they'd fall in, they're attracted to the positive charge of the nucleus and he, w he did calculations to work out exactly how far they'd be away so that they wouldn't fall in. And then another scientist did a, a series of experiments called James Chadwick and he proved the existence of the neutron. The only thing you need to know about James Chadwick is he found the neutron and he did experiments to do this. Um, and all of this has given rise to the modern version of the atom that we see today. Okay, right, I'm off. Um, take care, guys. I, I, I literally have to go. Um, nice one. Take care. And good luck, good luck, good luck, good luck. <laughs>